Hello everyone, this is Chapter 6 for DEP 2004 Lifespan Development with Miss Birmingham. So we're off to school with the young kids. So we're going to start with a quick review of Piaget that we started with last week. And remember Piaget had this development theory of our cognitive abilities. And what he said was is that as we develop, we're going to use the same process for getting information to our head. So the first thing is, is that when we get something new, we're going to begin to assimilate that new information. And what we're talking about here is sort of the kid who finally learns as arm moves or the one that you had last week where we go to the zoo and we say, hey, um, you know, lions have four legs. And as long as everything is wonderful and it's working out the way that we think it is, this kid is going to be in equilibrium. But then what happens is a new situation comes along. So all of a sudden this kid who thought that only his arm moved, now his leg moves. So this is a new situation. Or that lion who had four legs, he now sees a zebra and it has four legs, but it doesn't roar. So now they go into disequilibrium and when they're in disequilibrium they've got to get things to work the way they think it's going to work and so they will begin to assimilate this new information and when they've accommodated that new information then they can go back into equilibrium so as Piaget was talking about things what he said is is that the first stage of development is going to be the sensory motor stage now we're using sensory motor because what he said was is that the only way we get information into our head when we're a little baby is basically through our senses and by motoring around. And basically the child begins to interact with their environment. And then we kind of covered the pre-operational stage and that's where the, the child begins to represent the world symbolically. So they understand that there's a world out there, but remember that they're just beginning to understand that they have their own brain. So we talked about theory of the mind that somewhere around two ish, they begin to understand that voice in their head is their voice and that they can hear things inside their own brain, but they don't understand other people have different thoughts. Around three, they begin to be able to manipulate their thoughts. Around four, they begin to understand other people have other thoughts. And then the world begins to get very different for them because now we can bring information in through a new way. The other thing that he talked about is that people are at this age are very egocentric and they're egocentric because the world is all about them. And so when they view the world, they view the world in terms of how they define things. So now we're going to move on from there. The kids are getting a little bit older. And we're going to come into something called the concrete operational period. Now, here, the big thing that begins to happen, what is very exciting for kids, is that they begin to develop mental operations. And what that basically means is that they can now perform operations on their thoughts, meaning they can reverse things. In till now, basically whatever came into their brain is what was there. But now they can begin to manipulate that. So they can begin to have more formal thinking, you might want to say. They can say, oh, I think um, two plus two is four, or I think that might be a bird, or whatever it is. But there is a reason we call it concrete, or he called it concrete, because what's happened at this point is that children are defining their world based on their schemas. And remember, a schema is how we view things to be. And when things don't work the way we think they're going to work, that's when we have that disequilibrium and blah, blah, blah. Well, kids at this point have are 7 to 11 years old. They've got a pretty good sense of how the world works, or at least they think it works, and that's the big thing. And they have this resistance to anything that seems to be contrary to their known facts. Now, I, heard, I add the word there because... While this sentence down here is contrary to known facts, it's their known facts. So as an example, if I say I'm going to go order a pizza, but I'm going to get a 12 slice pizza, they might argue with me that pizzas don't come in 12 slices. Why? Because in their world, pizzas are only eight slices or they're only round. So when I say I'm going to get a square pizza, oh, no, 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 pizzas don't come square. Anybody who's a parent who's had a kid at this age and you're driving home and you take a different way home, the kids will argue that you're not going home correctly because they know how to go home. They've only seen one way to go home. 
So this is kind of an interesting time frame for them to sort of make these decisions. But the reason we call it concrete is because they base everything based on the knowledge that, that they have. And of course, their knowledge is a little bit limited at this point. From there, we're going to see that people go into what they call the formal operational period. Now, the big thing about the formal operational period is that we get this abstract thought and we can get hypotheticals. So as an example, here's a hypothetical. Let me ask you to put aside reality for a second. Think abstractly. And hypothetically, let's say that a bird's feather can break things. And so I want you to take this bird's feather in your head and I want you to go up to a glass vase and I want you to whack that feather against the vase. Now in your head, you probably either saw the vase explode or you saw the feather slice through the vase, but basically the feather broke the vase. You can do that because you have abstract thought and because you can think hypothetically, what if? The thing is, is that the concrete kids can't do that. They can't do the what if. If you do that same thing with a concrete kid, they will tell you, I can't see that. I can't think that. That's not possible. But you were able to because you are an older person. You have a more developed brain. And so you could think hypothetical. You could put aside sort of the reality of the world for just a few moments and said, okay, I can kind of imagine, you know, this feather breaking something. Now, what's what they're using or what you're using is something called deductive reasoning, where you can draw a conclusion from the known facts. So here's another question for you. Is a penguin a bird? Now, most of you will say, yes, a penguin is a bird. Now, how do you know a penguin is a bird? Because you see, for most people, they judge a bird based on the fact that it can fly. And yet penguins can't fly. Well, would you have done is that you know that there are other facts about birds such as birds have beaks or they lay eggs or they have feathers and you know that a penguin either has a beak or it lays eggs or it has a feathers or you've seen it's been classified as a bird but the concrete operational person couldn't do that because you see they only can draw the conclusion that a, something is a bird if it can fly Quite often when we're talking about penguins to little kids, we'll say, look, it's flying underwater. And that's how we get them to understand that a penguin is a bird. But as you get older, you're able to draw conclusions from multiple facts. And you're able to change your mind. Perhaps at first you said penguins weren't birds. But then when you began to learn other facts about what makes something a bird, you went, ah, a penguin is a bird. It's a type of bird. Piaget is not the only way that we tend to learn and think about things. We can also use what's called information processing. Basically, what happens here is that kids begin to get better at using the natural memory system. Now, back in your introduction to psychology class, hopefully you learn that there are three types of memory. And that first one is sensory memory right here. And so everything is coming into your brain to your sensory memory and your sensory memory is going to decide what to move forward and what not to move forward. But from sensory memory, we're going to move over to working memory. Now you might call this short term memory. Now working memory is just a type of short term memory. And that's one of the things to understand is that there are different types of short term memory, but working memory is what's going to be there. So we use perception. And perception, remember, we defined as that information that we have decided needs to be processed further on. So lots of stuff came into your sensory memory, lots of sounds, but only certain sounds got processed and moved over to working memory. And then in order to go from working memory over here to long term memory, we have to do something to it. In this case, we have to elaborate on it. And so this is sort of our learning, our saved sort of process and that we have to basically move something from here to there. Now, what's exciting is at this point, kids are beginning to be able to do this. Not only are they be able to do this, but they know that they're doing this. And so because they know they're doing this, they're going to start creating ways to have this happen. And that's this whole circle that we have here about the information processing. So what we know is that at seven to eight years of age, we begin to find ways to help us remember things. 
Before that, we just remembered something mostly based on emotions, but older children will begin to use methods. Basically, they'll use what we call elaborate rehearsal. Now, elaborate rehearsal requires two things, and the first one is organization. Up until now, kids just randomly, haphazardly did things. But somewhere around seven or eight, we're going to begin to organize information into categories, such as these are cars, these are birds, these are what my mom asks me to do, here's what my dad likes to do. And so we organize things into these patterns. Now, when we take new information and we begin to elaborate on it, we begin to hook it up with information we've had in the past. So we can go back to that penguin kind of situation. We had learned what birds were, we had them organized, and then we had to link this new piece of information to that piece of information. So some of you linked it to beaks, some of you linked it to eggs, some of you linked it to feathers, some of you linked it to a picture or a teacher. It doesn't really matter how you did it. What you did is you elaborated on it. You gave it more information. You did something to embellish it to help you remember it. This is what older kids begin to do. Now, as we get even older than seven or eight, probably more like around nine or 10, we begin to see them using external things outside my physical body that will help me remember things. So this is where we start seeing kids maybe write down a note or use a picture. Now they're saying use calendars. Okay, I don't know any 10 year old who uses a calendar per se, but hopefully by junior high school, we've given them calendars to try to help them remember things. In sixth grade, you'll see teachers are giving them calendars and having them write things down to help them remember things. We're trying to teach them some tools, but they probably won't really use it on their own until middle school or a little bit older than that. Metacognition is something that begins to happen about this age too. Basically all metacognition says is that I begin to identify and understand the world around me. And by doing that, I have started to make strategies to help me have a better cognitive mind to help me be aware of things and to, as they say, identify goals. And the goal may be that I want to know all the different players on the Buccaneer roster. And so I've set something up to help me do that. But basically what's interesting is, is that we begin to see kids use their brains and find ways to use their brains. Now this improves with age. You are much better at it now than you were when you were seven, but it's basically memory skills. The only problem is, is that some of you may still be using, trying to use the same memory skills that you used as a kid and you don't have a kid brain anymore. So you have to change your memory skills. Meta memory is basically just a subset of metacognition. All meta memory says is that we are beginning to understand that we have memory, but we say it's intuitive, meaning is that if you were to ask a seven or eight year old, do you have memory? They would probably look at you and go, what? Now, what happens is, is that they begin to understand that they do remember things and they can remember things. And that's why it also is concrete period because they get very, absolute about their memory and this because they're able to pull it out that must be how it is however what is interesting is as they get just a little bit older than that that's why we talked about the formal operational period is when they begin to understand that memory can also be not good and that some things I can remember easier than others. This is where we begin to pick up mnemonic devices or note taking or other things that begin to help us. You're not really going to see that begin to happen until kids are you know, 10, 11 -ish years old, because we now not only do we understand that we have memory, but we begin to understand that we can control it and that it's not as easy as we think. The other thing is, is that we also begin to understand that we have to pay attention to things and that we have to um, use our brain to help us understand and make connections. So this whole elementary school period time is really interesting to watch kids go from first grade to sixth grade and just see the cognitive development that just naturally begins to occur, this understanding. And what's happening is that our brain is growing. Our synapses are increasing. Remember, we don't come out with a full brain. And so our brain, as it grows and it has experiences and as it has frustrations and it has winning situations, it begins to understand more and more. And as the brain begins to understand and work, the children begin to understand and work. So the cognitive processes begin to get better. Now this brings us to intelligence. 
have to be a little careful with this one. Um, if you'll notice, I have not asked you to understand the definition of intelligence. What I have asked you to do is to understand some of the parts of intelligence. Now, intelligence is one of those things among the psychology community that we're still somewhat arguing about what is intelligence. But what I can tell you is that most psychologists will say intelligence is your ability to adapt to your circumstance. It is your ability to move and think with purpose. Now, notice that neither one of those has anything to do with how much you know from a book. Intelligence is much broader than that. And in your book, you're going to see a lot of information about intelligence, including the general G. What happens with intelligence is how we measure intelligence tends to be more of the argument we have. Because we don't have an absolute definition for intelligence, we have different ways. And so we have to determine sort of what is the best methodology to measure intelligence. And right now, what most people will tell you is that it takes more than one test. It takes many different tests. And these are not IQ tests that we're talking about. We're talking about tests that are developed to look at your entire use of your brain, not just your intellectual use. So one of the gentlemen that really has gone away from IQ and looked at intelligence is Howard Gardner. Now, Howard Gardner basically proposed this. He said that intelligence is sort of defined based on the society that you're in and what is and isn't intelligent. So here in the Space Coast, we may look at a rocket scientist as being very intelligent because they understand how to build and shoot off a rocket and how to make the fuel and all that kind of good stuff. And if we were to take that person, Howard Gardner says, and we were to take this very intelligent rocket scientist and we put him up in the mountains in Peru where there are no rockets and basically it's subsistence farming, would that person still be seen as intelligent? And the answer might be no because this person doesn't understand how to identify poisonous potatoes and how to take a poisonous potato and make it unpoisonous, which is what they do up in Peru in the mountain areas. He doesn't understand uh, farming techniques among these rocky crevices. They don't have good deep soil. Um, this person wouldn't understand animal husbandry, how to breed animals. And so this person may be seen as very unintelligent because basically he couldn't survive. Whereas the farmer who would be seen as very intelligent, who understands how to do all those things and make it through those frozen winters and how to store food. If we were to take that person who is considered very intelligent Peru and move him here to the space coast and put him in NASA, he might not be seen as intelligent. So he says intelligence is really measured by what society believes is intelligent and that this IQ is only one method. He really says what we have to do is look at the fact that there are multiple intelligences. And he came to this because he says that there are different distinct regions in the brain and different people have different abilities depending on the development of that region of the brain. And so as an example, you might have a, um, I use the gymnasts always as this, the Olympic gymnasts who are geniuses in body kinetics. They can manipulate and move their body and just twitch a muscle just right to help them jump and move and twirl and dance on that balance beam. Me, I can't basically walk down a hallway without hitting a wall, but these ladies are balancing on balance beams. And so they might be considered geniuses in body kinetics where I might be, um, intellectually disabled in body kinetics. So he said, we have to really look at these things. Think about musical as what there are people who can hear music, go over and just play it on the piano. They've heard it. They can interpret it. They know how to use their body and they just do it. However, our traditional IQ tests do not test for many of these things, such as interpersonal versus intrapersonal. Now, interpersonal is between two people, where intrapersonal is within oneself. So poets and songwriters would be interpersonal, in, intrapersonal, where a salesperson who kind of understands other people would be interpersonal. Now, nurses you need to have good interpersonal skills in order to be able to help your patients correctly. Um, naturalists would be those people who can seem to grow anything and they just look at something and it becomes green and you can get very you know, frustrated with that. 
because me, I look at something and it kind of wilts. I barely keep anything alive. So I might be really low on naturalistic, but I'm pretty high on logical and mathematical. I'm also pretty high on intrapersonal. So he says that you might have areas more than one that you tend to be pretty good on. And that this is one way we need to measure intelligence, that that IQ test is simply not old fashioned, it's limited in what it measures as far as brain usage. And if intelligence is about the use of the brain, then we need to measure the entire use of the brain. Now Steinberg comes along and he says, well, you know, I like of what a lot of what he says and that we did say that intelligence is your ability to adapt and to maneuver within your environment. And what he says is then in order for people to do that, there are three basically abilities that people have to have to be successful in intelligence. And those are analytical, creative, and practical. Now, analytical is being able to come to different solutions. So think the MacGyver of the intelligence world. I have a problem, how many different ways can I solve it? Um, NASA people will have a problem and how many different ways can they solve that problem? So the more analytical problem solving you have, basically the better and more intelligent you're going to seem within the world because you're going to be more successful using your intelligence. Creative is your ability to come up with new situations, something that unique or different. Now we have to make creative and artistic as two different things. Artistic is your ability to sing, dance, draw. But just because you're artistic doesn't mean you're creative. So if I'm singing somebody else's song, I'm not being creative. I may be artistic. I'm dancing somebody else's dance. I'm being artistic, but I'm not really being creative because I'm not creating for myself. Creative goes beyond the arts. Creative also goes into things like engineering. It goes into teaching. It goes into nursing. There are going to be people who come up with creative solutions. So when my mother was in the hospital not too long ago and she has macular degeneration, she couldn't see the buttons on the side of the bed and they all were flat. And so it's just a big flat panel to her and she can't see it. So how is she going to be able to understand how to raise and lower the bed? Now, the nurse's button, they found that when they had a little button you could push. That was a separate thing. But she couldn't raise and lower her bed. So a woman who was very creative, lots of nurses couldn't figure this out. But one nurse came in and she took the items that you would use for your EKGs, these leads, and she put it on the up button because that lead has a little metal kind of nipple on it and my mother could feel that metal nipple she could press the metal nipple and that would make the button go press the button which would make the bed go up so you see that was very creative nobody else had thought of that and it allowed my mother to be able to use the bed so creative is the ability to come up with something new and unique and we showed everybody and and they, all these people went oh why didn't we think of this why didn't we think of this and it was a very creative solution so now in the future other people may do the same thing when you have somebody who's blind or somebody who has low vision. Practical, oh, you know these practical people. This is your grandma who can just seem to solve most things. They basically have a working knowledge of something. And the mechanic who you pull in and all they have to do is hear the car and they understand what's wrong with the car. So you might call this street smart sometimes, but it's practical. So what we say is that when we know that somebody has some of these and some of you are going to be more analytical, some are going to be more creative, some are going to be more practical. But if we can create instructions for our patients that tends to go around their best ability, then we're going to find that they are most successful in learning and adapting. Now, the biggie out there that when people think of intelligence, they tend to think of the IQ or the intellectual quotient. Now the intellectual quotient or the IQ is basically a formula. And hopefully in your intro class, you learn this formula, which is IQ equals mental age over chronological age. Mental age is something that we measure based on other students or people. Chronological age is from birth to death. And then we multiply it times 100, mostly because, well, nobody likes decimals and we wanna get rid of the decimals. Now, for this, what they had to do is determine where is normal or abnormal. And we use statistics for this. Now, this is called the normal curve, this curve that you see right here. This is the normal curve. And basically, you have a population of people that would be going over here. And you know, maybe there's a thousand people at this point 
not very easy to write with this. And maybe we started down here with 100 people. And basically what they did is they went through and they took all these people they tested and they would plot them along on this chart to determine what their score was. And then once they got all the plots down, they could draw this line that you see right here. Oops, blue on blue doesn't work. Uh, let's use red. Um, they drew this line right here of where all the scores were and that gave them an idea of how things go. Now, the reason this is kind of important to understand is that this normal curve is used a lot in medicine. Why? Because this area right here, the stuff that's in the middle, this is where normal sits. And people often ask me, what is normal? Well, when you have 68% of your population, which is what this is, um, doing something, then that tends to be normal. So we have 68% of the people sit right here. So if your IQ comes between these two spots, then we would consider you to have normal IQ. Now, this has a very distinct name to it. And while we are not doing a statistics class, you should understand that this is called one standard deviations. In this case, it's a positive. But this is negative one standard deviations. Now, why is this negative? Because this middle spot right here, this is called the zero point. Zero. And we move everything either to the left or the right of zero. Zero being the middle. Basically, 50% of your people from this point to that point, that's where 50% of your scores are. So what we want to know is how far from the absolute middle are you? And the further you are from the absolute middle, basically the more unique you are. So you can see in this particular diagram that we have 13% of the 31% of the people on one side, 34% on the other side. This one to one standard deviation gives us 68% of the people. So if your score falls somewhere in there, you're going to be normal. Then what we're going to do is we're going to come over and to the next area and this line right here and this line right here would be considered two standard deviations. Now, when you start getting to two standard deviations, you basically have about 96% of the population between these two points. So between this point and this point is about 96% of the population. Now I say about because they're much more formal here, but it's all you need to know. Now, if we look at this, then what's left over, you can see that it's just, just a little over 2% of the population. So if only 2% of the population has a score, or only 2% of a population does something, it would be considered abnormal. So you can be abnormally this way, or you could be abnormally this way. Now, it will depend on what we're measuring, what we're studying, depending on which side we want to be again. Remember, positive and negative does not mean good and bad. It simply means left and right is zero. So if we're talking about IQ, as you can guess, most people would rather be on the um, upper end of the scale. But if we're talking about schizophrenic tendencies, we'd much rather be on the lower end. If we're talking about cancer markers, we'd much rather be on the lower end. So all this does is allow us to know how far from basically the middle or the average you are. For intelligence testing, they have some numbers down here, but we're going to look at the next slide to really get our numbers. The big thing for you to understand is that basically if you have a 70 or lower, you're going to be intellectually disabled. And if you have 130 or more, you're going to be considered gifted. So let's look at the actual scores when we talk about most common IQ tests these days. And you also can see that these days we've changed how the calculations are done just a tad. So the scores that we're interested in are these scores right here. If you score somewhere between 85 and 115, you are considered to have average intelligence. If you score 130 or higher, you're considered to have above average. And if you score 70 or lower, you're considered to basically have some sort of developmental disability. Uh, these numbers work with the Stanford Binet and many other types of testing. Although some might be slightly different, you're pretty close.
Now there's going to be some of you who are going to say, but what about this area right here? And what about this area right here? If this is normal, then what is this and what is this? Well, this is called bright and this is called dull. And so what we're talking about here is in the upper area, these bright people, they can learn a little better than the average bear, but they're not super great, you might want to say. Whereas dull might be a little bit, take a little lo longer to learn something or do something, but they're not mentally in incapable. So what numbers should we come out of here? Well, the first thing is that we need to know that 70 or below is going to be intellectually disabled. 85 to 115 is going to be considered normal. 100 is the middle. And then 130 or above is going to be considered gifted. Those are the numbers you need to sort of come out with. And that gives us a good idea of what's going on when we talk about people's intelligence. So why do we use IQ if IQ is not perhaps as good as we like to think it is? What, what we do know is it does predict some things. We have found that if you have a slightly higher IQ, that you tend to be more successful in life but it doesn't mean that you're going to be as successful. Um, in Scotland, they found really interestingly, this whole catalog of people who had taken IQ tests. Back in, and don't quote me on the date, but I think it was somewhere in the 30s, every student in Scotland had to take an IQ test, every single student. And about 50, 60 years later, they found all the test results again. They had been buried in a basement and they had every single Scottish student's IQ score. So they asked these people to come back to sit for the test again. Now these people were now like 70 years old. So they could compare them from when they were younger to when they're older now at 70. And so these people came back and as many that could came back and took the test again. And some interesting things happened. One is that they found that people who um, had already tested a little higher in IQ tended to still be alive. People who had smoked tended to see their IQ not increase, but for most people, their IQ had increased. People with slightly higher IQs tended to um, be healthier. People who tended, um, people with slightly lower IQs um, tended to uh, be, I wanna say more beat up as far as their body was concerned and they were not as alive. They were less of them. So what they're kind of drew a conclusion from this is that your IQ may show how well wired you are and the better wired your brain is, perhaps better wired your whole body is. It also may allow you to make choices that allow you to have a different life, you might want to say. So if you're a little better wired, you might think a little better. And because you can think a little bit better, you might be able to obtain jobs that are not as physically demanding, or you might be able to make slightly better decisions and thus allowing you to have a slightly better successful life. However, what we did find is that the predictions are not exactly perfect. So one reason they don't use IQ tests as standards for getting into school is that we really found that your IQ did not predict how well you were going to succeed in school. Actually, past performance tended to predict how well you were going to succeed in school. This is one reason why universities are always interested in where you place in your high school. Because if you place in the top, then there's a likelihood you'll place in the top or you'll do well in their school. Even if you have a really high IQ, if you don't place in the top of the school, if you don't pace, place in the top 25%, what this may show is that you don't have the motivation and drive and the self-discipline to learn. And to self-discipline tends to really show the ability for someone to be successful academically or not. And you know lots of people who are plenty smart who can't get through school. So it has nothing to do with the IQ as much as motivation. Now, people also ask me about heredity. Does my heredity, basically my genes, make a difference in my IQ? And the answer is a little bit. Um, 
what we have here is a study and you hear the first one is identical twins that were reared together versus identical twins that were reared apart now here we can see that identical twins that were reared together have this IQ that is that similar and these are the ones reared apart now this is a standard deviation as we learned in standard deviations the highest deviation you can have is basically a positive one or a negative one in this case they're going on the positive side and so we can see that there is a difference between whether you were raised together or you were raised apart so the concept is is that this difference right here is based on environment because identical twins tend to have the same DNA. And we can see that if they were raised together, they have almost a perfect correlation. That 0.9, remember, was very, very strong as far as a correlation was concerned. 0.1 was a perfect correlation. So the, we tend to see them reared together as being almost exactly the same. So one of them may have a 115 and one has a 116. I mean, very little difference. But when we get down to being reared apart, we begin to see they hit the 0.7. Now, 0.7 is still a very strong correlation, but this also shows that there is some room for environment. Now, one of the problems uh, or one of the things that people often state with this particular study is that we just don't have a lot of twins, identical twins that were raised apart. To study so there's a small sample size and so the question has always been does the sample size make a difference well we can also look at fraternal twins so these are two people who were born at the same time in the womb together but they don't have the same identical egg so you can think of you know you sometimes have a boy and a girl who are twins they're born together well they can't be identical because they're two different sexes and so how are I did how are fraternal twins and so fraternal twins you can see they're right about the 0.6 so they're sort of in the medium level but they're still pretty similar basically and then we have siblings who are reared apart and they fall down to here so they're just a little below the sort of the strong type right here um, but if we what we really want to look at is let's look at this difference between here and here and again we can talk about the fact that this tends to show that there is some heredity part to it but it also says tends to show there's some um, environmental part but that part the the one that really tends to show the strongest as far as heredity is concerned is unrelated individuals so basically the adopted kids so adopted kids tend to have an IQ closer to their biological parents than they do to their adopted parents and we found this over and over again now one of the things that is interesting is that when these adopted kids IQs are tested they do tend to test a little higher than their biological parents so let's say the adopted kid tests out at 110 the biological parent is at 100 the adopted parent may be 130 um, what we think is happening here is again we're getting a lot of our abilities from our parents but the environment does play a role in how it gets shaped so our potential comes from our parents the environment will help us reach our potential so you think about it I can take somebody who has got a perfectly normal brain and if I don't give them enough stimulus I can make them an abnormal brain which means they've never reached their full potential as far as intelligence is concerned whereas we take somebody else who has um, perhaps a slightly not as functioning well brain so somebody with Down syndrome and we give them all the environment in the world we can make them better but we can never bring them back up to fully normal so what the environment's going to be able to do is enhance what your potential is but environment isn't going to be able to make you better than your potential you might want to say your potential comes from heredity so with the environmental factor what we do know is a couple other interesting things one is that while we can't exactly speak to it we do know that during the 20th century our IQ scores have increased now in part what we think that is happening is because of the educational systems that we have in place now everybody basically gets educated here at least in the United States and in most Western facing countries where most of the study has been done and that is because as 
our parents are more educated, then they can bring that on to the next generation, which is why this last one right here about poverty tends to be very interesting because what we do is that poverty does tend to make it harder for some of these kids to reach their full potential. What they did is they went through and they did a lot of studies and what they found was is that your parents' educational levels made a huge difference on your educational level. So if you're coming out of poverty, quite often your parents may not have had a high educational level. That's why they'd be taking jobs that had lower income in the first place or maybe didn't need as much um, intellectual ability and thus they struggled more to be able to raise themselves out of poverty because of the low wage jobs that they were in. But because this parent had a lower education, they weren't able to educate their children before they went to school. And so these children who were coming in from poor areas of the country had lower IQs coming in in the first place. They knew less in the first place because their parents weren't able to teach them. Where children coming out of areas where there was middle income or higher income and we're talking just simple middle income here they came into school with a lot more knowledge in the first place because their parents had a lot more knowledge so if i have parents who are literate how are they going to be able to teach me my abcs and one two threes if they don't know them themselves but a middle income family who is literate those parents are teaching their kids abcs and one two threes so those kids come into school already knowing that where the kids coming out of poverty may have had parents who didn't know it and thus they were coming in already behind they were already starting behind so they have to catch up from day one that is why we started to put in place some of these VPK programs or Head Start programs because we found if we went into areas where there was great poverty and we had the ability to help these students or these kids basically get information and knowledge that they weren't able to get at home because either the parents didn't have it or the parents are working two jobs and just don't have the time to do it because they're basically trying to just get food on the table, more or less be able to take them to the science center or introduce them to all kinds of learning materials that they can't afford. Then if we took them and gave them this head start, you might want to say that when they hit kindergarten, they were equal to the other kids coming into kindergarten and they tended to stay equal all along. So what is the final analysis on this? Basically, we're just going to sort of go here. We know that 50% of your abilities as far as intellectual probably comes from the environment and 50% of your abilities or your intellectual capacity probably comes from your DNA. So you can blame your parents if you're not good at math. So we talked a little bit about gifted. Gifted, remember we said was IQ scores of 100 or 30 or higher. But when we talk about gifted, we have to look at gifted in more than one way. Now the 130 or higher one that we tend to talk about right here, that we tend to think about as being a school sort of thing. Those children are in gifted programs because their IQ was tested higher. But gifted goes beyond. If we use Howard Gardner's kind of concepts, then we have to bring in this type of gifted because gifted also could mean that they have extreme talents. So the kid who can hear the music and go and play it on the piano without having taken any real lessons. Um, the kid who seems to be able to uh, cook without really understanding all the formalities of cooking, but they've got this. So gifted is not just simply an academic gifted. We also talk about people who have above average talents in something. So the kid who can draw, the kid who can dance, the kid who can write. Basically, they tend to be very high in their divergent thinking, which is really interesting. They're also very passionate about their subjects. So you can think about a Simone Biles, who is a fantastic gymnast. She would be gifted in gymnastics. So we have to bring gifted as sort of a larger viewpoint. The other thing that we have to really sort of break the the concept of is that if you are gifted then you're emotionally troubled or you're inept this is so inaccurate in fact when they went out and they looked at gifted children who had iqs of 130 or higher they actually tended to find that these kids were able to understand society better and they knew how to blend into society better. Kids who were at the 130 actually did much better in society, had more friends, were able to understand social circumstances far better. But why do we have the stereotype? Well, because it comes from TV.
And if you think about it, when we look at kids show, the smart kid is always sort of the dorky kid. They're never the leader. It's the one who's got the most charisma is the leader. Um, think about it. Even the jock kid is not the leader. They're often seen as kind of dumb. Um, but if we think about the people who really have a lot of um, intelligence, they, they tend to group people around them. They tend to have, be attractive and people tend to want to come to them. So hopefully we can sort of kill that stereotype at some point. These days we call it um, the dorky cute or something like that. So they're intelligent, but they're cute. I'd rather go with that one. And then children with intellectual dis disabilities. Now, here you what you need to remember is that when we talk about kids with intellectual disabilities, these are the parameters to have that decision. First of all, it has to happen before they're 18 years of age. Now, why before they're 18 years of age? Well, if they're after 18, basically their brain is developed. And so let's say 25 year old Johnny went out today and Johnny got a car wreck and Johnny got a concussion and now he doesn't seem to think as well. Well, Johnny isn't intellectually disabled. Johnny now has brain injury. So we see people over 18 years of age, if we start seeing um, intellectual disability or, or their intellect not working as well, they tend to be because of brain injury, brain diseases. They started with a normal brain, but something has happened after that. For intellectual disability, we had to have a brain that was somewhat damaged before 18. So we also know that their IQ score has to be 70 or less, but they also have to have problems adapting to their environment. And that may be whether it's conceptual skills, social skills, practical skills. Basically, remember we said one of the definitions for intelligence is your ability to function purposefully within your environment. And for these folks, that may be very difficult for them. Um, if you've never seen the movie Rain Man, that would be a really good movie to watch. Now, there's a difference between a child who has an intellectual disability and a child with a learning disability. Two totally different things. First of all, a child with a learning disability, they must have at least normal intelligence right here, normal intelligence. So they have to be at least 100 or above. If you're not I don't know, actually, actually, I guess 85 and above, but basically we say 100 or above. If you don't have normal intelligence, then you don't have a learning disability. What you have is an intellectual disability. But a learning disability basically says they may have difficulty mastering a subject in a traditional classroom. So the question is, is what is the disability? So one of the ones I tend to point out is this one down here, the auditory processing disorder one. Let's see if I can draw a circle around that. No matter what color I use, it's going to be wrong. Um, this is kind of an interesting one because what happens here, so we have kids who basically their auditory systems didn't quite wire up correctly. They process all the ear stuff. It comes into the ears fine. They're, there's nothing wrong with your ears, but the wiring between the ears and the brain isn't quite right. And so they have a very hard time processing the information that comes in. Because remember, we said processing is the ability of the brain to take this information and to use it. So for them, something like pig, rig, dig, they may all sound the same. They may have difficulty getting background noise out. You, you're listening to this and there may be other noises going on around you, but you're able to filter those out to just hear me. Kids with auditory processing disorder may not be able to do that. So if they're in a classroom and you have the teacher trying to give a lecture and the meanwhile there's a kid behind them giggling or doing something and there's some dogs barking outside and there's another one tapping their fingers on the desk, these kids would find it very hard to eliminate all those and just hear the teacher, which would give them a disadvantage in learning. They may look like they're not learning and that may not be the truth at all. They basically would have to have maybe some one-on-one -on -one or what we call quiet time. They might have to wear, um, and for some of this, this really works well, they wear headphones and the teacher has a microphone. And so when she's lecturing out to the class, the only thing the kids can hear is the teacher's voice, none of the other items in the class. Now, in some cases, we can work with these people and have them learn in other ways. In some cases, we have to put them in classrooms in which the learning is done specifically for that disability. So dyslexia has uh, something called the Gilliam 
method of teaching. So kids who are really dyslexic may go to the Gilliams type schools. And for you and I, that may seem like a little strange if we were to go into that lesson learning, but for them, it would work the way that their brain works. So think about somebody who may be hearing um, impaired and we take um, you and we put you into a classroom for the deaf, you might be at a great disadvantage because you don't get what they're signing. Well, that's what sort of happens with people who have learning disabilities. You put them into a normal classroom and they feel like you might feel because they're having a disability with this, but put them into a situation which everybody is learning in the same way as they learn and then they're perfectly fine. So they have to have normal intelligence. They can't be abnormal intelligence. They have to have normal intelligence. It's just that they have to maybe take information in in a different way than the traditional methodologies that we use in today's education systems. This brings us to ADHD. And yes, ADHD is real. It does exist. It can be overdiagnosed, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But let's talk about the reality of ADHD. Um, it used to be that ADHD was divided into several different categories. You'd have ADD, AHD, ADHD. And then after a while, they said, you know what? We're just going to put them all into one thing and make it an umbrella disease or diagnosis. So you can have people who simply have the inattentiveness part or people who only have the hyperactivity or people who have only the impulse or somebody who has basically both. What we know is that it is linked to certain areas of the brain that may not have developed quite as well. And again, part of our problem with this is that because they've kind of combined them all together, um, it makes it a little bit harder for us to see. But um, we know the impulse control area of the brain may not be as well developed in some kids who have ADHD than in other kids. The attention part of our brain may not be as well developed in some areas of our brain as kids who have it. Also, blood flow seems to be an issue with having a lack of blood flow um, in some areas of the brain with kids with ADHD than kids who don't have it. So we do know that this is a real item. What we have to be careful of with ADHD though, is that we tend to think we could just be, control this through behavior or we can just control this through medication. And both of those answers is false. It's going to take a combination of both behavioral and medication for kids with ADHD. Also, we have different levels of ADHD, just like you have different levels of other um, diagnoses. I like to sort of equate this to diabetes. If we were to talk to a kid who is a diabetic and we said, just simply learn to change your food, is that really going to help the diabetic kid? Well, yeah, they can change their food, but they're still going to have problems with their their sugar levels, but we're not giving them any medication for the problems with their sugar levels. Or we say, hey, just take this medication and that's all you have to do. Well, they don't change their behaviors. They're going to be eating a lot of cake and taking a lot of insulin. It really takes a combination of both behavioral changes, what they put in their mouth, and medication to get that diabetes under control. Well, think of ADHD as the same way. It's going to take a combination of behavioral changes and medication to help get ADHD symptoms under control. One of the big falsities that is out there is that we're going to outgrow ADHD. It's just simply them being young. Well, it may be if they were misdiagnosed, but if they're truly diagnosed, they're not going to outgrow it. And Adam Levine and several other people can talk to you about the fact that they have adult level ADHD. What happens is sometimes in adolescence, you hear people say, oh, I don't need that medication anymore. Ah, blah, 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 blah. And what you find out is that they're drinking four or five monster drinks a day. Well, they're self-medicating because the medication that we give is a stimulant. And the stimulant helps stimulate the development of certain neurotransmitters and stimulate blood flow, which seems to help where they're lacking. Well, if I drink a lot of monster drinks, I'm just self-stimulating. So I'm still taking medication. It's just a lot more expensive because monster drinks are pretty expensive. Now, what about the misdiagnosis? Well, our biggest problem with misdiagnosis is that quite often ADHD is trying to be diagnosed when kids are in first and second grade. This is also the time that other problems can start to show because kids are now at school and they're being asked to do certain things. So something like auditory processing disorder, 
that tends to show up about then too. So if a kid can't hear real well, or they can't process the information, let's say that, they can't process the information, and the teacher is reading a book out loud, and they can't understand what the teacher is saying, they're going to look like they don't have any attention span, and they're going to ask weird questions, and they're going to seem distracted because basically they have no idea what the teacher is saying, and they may get you know, having trouble sitting around because, you know, if you're not following the story, how interested are you in it? So they could be being seen as being ADHD, but really they have auditory processing disorder. Or kids can also begin to develop right about now on narcolepsy. And so kids who are narcolepsy, they're going to move a lot to help keep themselves awake. They do become um, distracted because they're tired. They often have difficulty listening because they're tired and they're trying to keep themselves awake. They can rush through tasks because they can feel the tiredness that they have. So part of our problem with some of this misdiagnosis is that they really have other issues, underlying issues that can't be as easily diagnosed at this age. So they may be diagnosed with ADHD and then as they get older, we begin to realize it's not ADHD, it's something else. Also, there are some problems such as narcolepsy and that the drugs that we give for ADHD is also the drugs we give for narcolepsy. So in our own weird way, we have cured the person of their narcolepsy, but we think we're really helping them with their ADHD. So there is a lot more research that's going on. What we really need is a better way to determine whether somebody has ADHD or if they have another underlying the younger they are, the harder it is to figure this out because a kid who might have auditory processing disorder, they don't even know that they can't hear things as well as somebody else. So it takes a professional to figure this out. We really need to sort of eliminate other things to make sure that it is ADHD. Don't do a whole lot with the growth section right here, primarily because it's pretty simple right out there. Um, you can read this slide, you can read the book. We know we need a lot of calories because they're growing. Don't you wish at our age we could eat 2,400 calories a day? But let's talk about motor skills. So there are two types of motor skills, fine and gross. Fine, you can think of your fingers. Those are the fine little things you need to do. The gross motors are like your big mus muscles, your legs and things like this. Now, we know that girls are better at your fine motor skill, things like handwriting, and the boys, they tend to be better at gross motor skills with strength, throwing, catching. But notice that it says girls have certain motor skills, such as flexibility and balance. We do know that we have different things on our bodies, and especially as the they begin to develop, we're going to see huge differences. One of the biggest differences is that boys are going to develop upper body strength that the girls don't. The boys have pectoral muscles that the girls just don't have because the girls are going to develop breasts in order to feed. So when it comes to throwing, and you'll see that in that chart in your book, the boys can out throw a girl really well. But when it comes to jumping, notice on that same chart that a girl can jump basically as far as a boy can jump. In fact, according to um, the world record holders or whatever, whoever records these, there is a female jumper called Jackie Joyner Kersey. She was a great jumper. And in all of recorded jumping times, there are only five men who out jumped Jackie Joyner Kersey. We're talking about in the Olympics from the beginning of those Olympics, only five guys who've jumped further than her. So you can see something with, you know, gross motor in our legs that, girls and boys are pretty much the same, but when it comes to that upper body, very different. And then when it comes to basically the fine motor skills, especially when they're younger, girls are much better at fine motor skills. Now, as boys get older, they can develop those fine motor skills. It's going to take practice basically for them. It isn't as natural the same way that it's not as natural for girls to throw, but they can also learn and develop those motor skills and learn and develop those muscles to be able to throw just as well or close, you might say. Now, the last thing I want to bring in is stereotype threat. Now, I bring it in here because they have it in this section of the book. It really, to me, flows more with something we're going to talk about in chapter seven, but it's in this chapter, so let's do it.
A stereotype threat is basically what we say is self-fulfilling prophecy. If you are part of a group and that group is seen to be in a certain way and you take that information in and say, well, that's how everyone's going to view me or that's how it is, then you will perform and act in that way. So as a simple one, for the longest time, they said girls can't do math. Girls are bad at math. Well, if I'm a female and I keep hearing how girls are bad at math and girls are bad at math and girls can't do this, then as I begin to move into school, I begin to say, hey, you know, it's math class. I'm going to be bad at this because I've heard girls are bad at math. And so what's interesting is because I believe that my brain will actually function the way that I believe. And we've seen people turn basically their math section of their brains off. We also have the interesting thing in which if I believe that because I'm a female, I'm going to be bad at math, then I will produce a lot more anxiety when it comes to taking a math test. And anxiety shuts down the brain in many areas. It especially shuts down the memory section of the brain. So I now, because I believe I'm going to be bad at math because I'm a female, I am now shutting down the memory section of my brain, which I need in order to do math. But self-fulfilling prophecy also can have people have certain behavior patterns. So let's say that I have been raised to um, around me and around the world, they say, oh, let me give one. Um, redheads are fiery and um, they have a lot of emotional uh, outbursts. Well, if that's what I think everybody's going to think about me, then I might as well be that way. After all, that's what you're going to say. And I learned this very early in life. And so they say, oh, here comes that fiery redhead. Oh, Stephen, you're going to be lucky to have her in your class. And I go, well, I guess that means I can be fiery then. And so I go ahead and behave that way because I figured that's how you're going to treat me. If um, I figure I've been convicted of a crime and you think all criminals must be bad people and they're always going to be bad people. And when I come out of jail and I go into society, I'm going to go ahead and act like a thug because after all, you're going to think I'm a thug. So I might as well act like a thug. And so these stereotype threats, these self-fulfilling prophecies can really direct and be change a lot of our behavior patterns. And that's why we're always talking about having to change the stereotype or at least looking at an individual as an individual rather than putting them within a group because if we treat the entire group the same way then everybody in that group is going to act that way even though that that is not true and you can think about that yourself there are probably things that people have just assumed about you because of some either physical aspect of yourself or a cultural aspect about you and yet you know that's not true but they made that assumption and the question is is did you act on that assumption did you act in some way that would help that assumption move Move forward because you figured people were going to act that way anyway so what the hell might as well well that's the end of this lecture if you have any questions please email me at ramona b at kaiseruniversity.edu and we'll move on to chapter seven next